Our next speaker is Dr. Diane Daly. Dr. Daly is a board-certified pediatric anesthesiologist um, and is currently a practicing partner with Boulder Valley Anesthesia Group here at Boulder Community Health. Dr. Daly is also the founder and CEO of Predict, Align, and Prevent, a nonprofit organization that employs location-based data science uh, and binds it to a community organizers and aligns efforts. Dr. Daly is focused on the commitment to open science, objective metrics, and child-centric outcomes, and is my very good friend and one of the smartest people I know. So please welcome Dr. Daly. Thank you so much for inviting me, Laura. Hey, um, so this is gonna start out a little bit sad, and I know that it's gonna sound like I'm gonna talk only about children, but this really connects with the work that we do uh, in any sort of trauma. So, and you'll see what I mean as we get into it. So the reason I wanted to open with this picture is that about seven years into my practice as a pediatric anesthesiologist, I had a boy that looked just about like this come into my operating room one night and bleed to death from getting drop kicked by his father. And that night when that baby was dying, I promised him that if there was something that I could do to help other babies like him, to try to get in between whoever was trying to hurt them and them, that I would do it. And it's taken me on 10 years of work for child abuse prevention. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So starting out after that event occurred, as an anesthesiologist, I didn't have a lot of knowledge about child abuse. Uh, just you know the things that you learn in the books about head trauma or which fractures to look out for, that sort of thing. But I didn't know, for example, the most common causes of death in children that are abused or neglected. So in red here, I have the things that are uh, the most common with physical abuse, which is the, the beating deaths, which cause abuse of head trauma or blunt abdominal trauma. You also run into uh, firearm deaths and burns and things like that. So there's definitely a connection to trauma, even though we don't take care of pediatric trauma patients in the ORs here, they do come through the ER occasionally. Other things that I didn't know at the time were that in the United States, there are about 600,000 victims of child maltreatment each year. And last, or in 2022, which was the most current year of uh, reporting, there were about 1,990 child abuse related deaths in the United States. And that number is actually up from it, where it was in the 1990s. The, uh, the total number of victims is down, but the number of fatalities has gone up since the 1990s. Now, the way that child maltreatment connects to all of the, the people that we take care of in our clinics and in the hospital and in the operating room is through adverse childhood experiences. Can I see a, a show of hands? How many people have heard of adverse childhood experiences? Oh, good. That's more than it, than it used to be. Uh, about half of you. So adverse childhood experiences are things that if people experience before the age of 18, increase their risk of a wide variety of health and social and educational and economic problems later in their life. So if someone has experienced physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, neglect, or if they have household dysfunction that includes mental illness, domestic violence in the home, divorce, substance abuse, or having an incarcerated relative. If you have four or more of those before the age of 18, you have a, a much greater risk of developing these problems. And the way that this happens is that if you have the adverse childhood experiences, which is the second green band, you end up with disrupted neurodevelopment because your brain is, is cycling over and over on practicing being in a very stressed out fight or flight or freeze type state, which alters the way that your brain grows. You end up with social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, adoption of health risk or of health risky behavior, diseases and disability, social problems, and you have an increased risk of early death. So people that have four or more ACEs are more likely than others to die about 20 years prematurely. And the types of behavior and physical and mental health problems that are associated with having four or more adverse childhood experiences, some of them are listed here. So you can see here things like uh, lack of physical activity and severe obesity, smoking, alcoholism, drug use, missed work, diabetes, depression, suicide attempts, sexually transmitted infections, heart disease, cancer, stroke, COPD, and broken bones, and also all types of uh, traumatic events or being involved in things like shootings go up if you have these experiences as well. 
So if you look at this list, you, you can see here a lot of the population that we deal with that have suicide attempts or the homeless population you can see in, in this list as well. So these are the adults that have experienced child maltreatment um, as a child or these other problems inside their home. So about one in seven children in the United States experiences abuse or neglect per year, and the total lifetime economic burden of child abuse, this was from 2018, is estimated to be at about 592 billion. So this is a very expensive problem that affects our pediatric and adult populations, and with my emotional experience with that child, what I wanted to focus on was prevention. How do you get ahead of this? How do you prevent this from happening? So the question, the first question is, how do you find at-risk families before a child is harmed? And an important statistic here is that about half of children who die from child abuse and neglect are not known to child welfare at the time of their death. So half of them, nobody has seen them before or reported them to child welfare, so they are just in the wild, and the first time you see them is when they come in with a serious or fatal injury. So I looked first to predictive analytics. And there are two types of predictive analytics. You've got person-based and place-based. So person-based predictive analytics would try to figure out who is this guy right here? Can we predict who this guy is gonna be before he attacks this woman? But the problem with person-based predictive analytics is that you can give someone the same you know, 10 characteristics that makes them more likely to have a certain behavior, but it's very hard to predict what an individual is going to do. So you could have all of the high risk uh, problems and not be someone that's gonna go on to rape someone or harm someone. Um, or you could have few of the risk factors and go on to be a perpetrator of these types of things. So it's difficult to predict uh, who is going to do which particular thing. But you can also look at where certain behaviors are likely to occur. So in this case, what we're looking at here is if, if we were looking at uh, where would we find children that are exhibiting the behavior of playing, we all know that we would look at a playground. A, and let me ask you the question, why is that? What, is it, what are the features of this environment that increase the likelihood that you're gonna find a child playing at a playground? You've got the playground equipment, you've got um, you know, the padding on the ground, you've got a bathroom nearby, maybe you have a parking lot, you have a fence around the, the playground. All of these things are features of this environment that increase the likelihood that you're gonna find a child exhibiting the behavior of playing there. So you can make predictions based on this as well. And this is the basis of the predict part of predict, align, prevent. So, what, we, what you look at, really, when you're looking at place-based predictions is in the center here, where it says 6717 Chu Avenue, if you were going to place a playground there, you would want to look at the features surrounding that area to see, is this a place where a playground is going to be successful? So you're gonna look at things like, are there other you know, tennis courts? Are there places where adults are gonna be playing? Are you close to the green dot where it has a, you know, a bunch of shops where people can go to get something to eat? Are you near a main road, which is the blue dot? And are you in a residential area, which would be represented by the orange dot? So each of these, um, each of these dots represents a feature of the environment that supports the, um, the success of a playground in this area. And what you can do statistically is measure the distance between the different dots and how many of those dots exist and how close they are to the thing that you're trying to, um, to find, which in this case would be a playground. And you can do the same thing with child maltreatment. So the features of the environment, though, are going to be different. So one thing I want to point out is that when you're doing um, the feature engineering or if you're trying to figure out place-based uh, predictive analytics for child maltreatment, you have to be able to put everything on a map, like the picture that I just showed you. So you have to be able to, to have an address of where the feature of the environment is, just like a residential household or a um, tennis court, something like that. So I wanna take you through what the features of the environment would be, what you would be looking for if you're trying to um, predict where child maltreatment is likely to occur. So you've got child risk factors for child maltreatment, and that includes just a child below the age of one and their regular behavior. 
children, the, the more vulnerable they are, the more likely they are to be abused or neglected. So any uh, newborns or infants during their crying periods or when they're going through their colicky periods, they have an increased risk of experiencing child maltreatment. During uh, developmental milestones like potty training, they are also at an increased risk of child maltreatment, especially if the parent doesn't have knowledge of uh, normal child behavior and development. If you have a child that, has, um, that was born prematurely or if they have high medical needs, that increases their risk of child maltreatment, and so does um, having multiples. And if you think about the thing that is common across all of these is all of these different things make having a child in your life, it makes your life a lot harder, right? And so anything that is going to increase the stress in your life is gonna increase the risk of that child being victimized. Then you can look, oh, I wanted to mention that when you're trying to figure out how to put this type of thing on a map, you have to think about where the data comes from. So if you're looking at uh, you know, how many children are born in a certain area, you're looking at census data. If you're looking at uh, you know, sta stages of life, you'd probably also be looking at census data. But if you're looking for children with disabilities or uh, children that were born prematurely, you're gonna be looking to hospital data, to uh, insurance data, or even to health and human services data. So to be able to get this information, to put it on a map, you have to work with a lot of different agencies and organizations to be able to do that. Now, if you're looking at perpetrator risk factors, you're looking for young mothers. Um, that, the data for them is probably gonna come through public health if you're looking at teen birth. You're looking at alcohol and drug abuse and domestic violence. This type of data would come from the police. You're gonna be looking for poverty data. This would come primarily from census. You're gonna be looking at the way that people perceive uh, normal parenting or healthy parenting. Some people, the more authoritarian uh, styles of parenting are gonna be more um, likely to engage in abusive behaviors. And you may be able to get uh, ideas about people's perception of certain types of parenting from nonprofit organizations. Mental illness data is going to come from the healthcare system or um, health insurance again. Another risk for child maltreatment is having low education, especially if you have babies when you're very young. And so this, this type of data would come from the Department of Education. And then you're also gonna be looking at social isolation as a risk factor. And this information would probably also come from nonprofit organization type surveys. So these are perpetrator risk factors. Then we already talked about adverse childhood experiences. So if you wanted to see in a community where people, where domestic violence or divorce or substance abuse, those types of things were occurring, you look to police data or health and human services data. And if you wanna look at the outcomes associated with adverse childhood experiences and child maltreatment, you're gonna be looking again to hospital and um, health insurance data. So the reason that I showed all of that to you is that you want to be able to put on a map the features that are likely to increase the risk of child maltreatment, so things like substance abuse and domestic violence, and to put them on a map, to be able to make map layers, you have to have an address. So you have to put all of those uh, different data points in different layers on a map, and what you end up with at the end is a map like this that is a risk map. So the first time that I did this was in the city of Fort Worth, Texas, so that's what you're looking at here. And the purple areas are the highest risk places for child maltreatment based on our analysis. Uh, the pink areas are the areas that are the second highest risk. So this was in uh, 2012, and we were, using data, we were using a system called risk terrain modeling, which was a pr proprietary for-profit software. But what we got out of it after we uh, looked at the data from the next year at where child maltreatment actually occurred, we were able, the green dots here represent where child maltreatment actually occurred in the following year. So we were able to predict where child maltreatment was likely to occur in the future. And we did this with a, a, a guy named Michael Bachman at Texas Christian University. But I really didn't like that the methodology, even though successful, was proprietary and for-profit. Like Laura said, I'm really into open science. And so we worked with, um, we worked with a, a guy out of Penn Design 
that was also really into open science and developed another uh, methodology, which is now free open source on GitHub that anybody can use to do the same types of predictions. So in this case, this is Richmond, Virginia. This was, I think, the following year or the year after. And the yellow areas are the areas where we predicted child maltreatment would occur in the following year. And the black dots on this are where child maltreatment actually occurred in the following year. Um, I'm gonna back up one slide because one other thing that, is, uh, that we get out of this type of prediction is a list of, in order of importance, of the features of the environment that were the most predictive. So this was from uh, Fort Worth, but what we found is that if you had in one of the little areas a high density of domestic violence, teenage runaways, aggravated assault, murder, gang violence, and drugs, that that's the, that's the cell um, or the area on the map where the majority of child maltreatment was gonna happen. Now, if you're only looking at crime data, this was pretty consistent across multiple sites. Over time, after I started uh, the nonprofit Predict Align Prevent and continued this work in six states, um, we found these things to be true with domestic violence and runaways being at the top uh, the majority of the time. So essentially what we found, without going into more, more sites, is that if you look at the highest risk places in the, on the maps in these cities, so in this case in the yellow areas, you find more than half of the uh, maltreatment. In, in Richmond, it was close to 70% of maltreatment occurred in the highest risk places. Um, more than half of the child abuse fatalities and about 60, a little more than 60% of the children removed into foster care. So what this does is it gives you an opportunity to know exactly where to focus your resources in the following year to prevent these things from happening. But we also wanted to see, based on the idea that there could be too much bias in the data that would be pointing at minority communities and uh, that could just be, we could have certain communities overrepresented in the data where maybe child maltreatment wasn't actually happening. We wanted to correct for that. And so to look at that, we, uh, we actually used the ACEs outcomes, so the outcomes associated with child maltreatment and adverse childhood experiences to see if we could predict where child maltreatment would occur based on those things, and we could. So this is rural New Hampshire, and what we found was that um, if you look at the, again, at a ranking of the things that occurred around child maltreatment, that what you found was that you had diabetes, lead exposure in children, drug abuse, overdose, sale, and manufacturing, drug abuse during pregnancy, assault and community violence, neonatal abstinence syndrome, urinary tract infections, and asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So this is adult and child data included in this. So if you had an area where you had a lot of these things occurring, and this is all hospital data, that is also where child maltreatment is likely to occur. So you can predict it with, uh, with different types of data depending on what you have. And the takeaway message from the entire predictive part of this is that in about 5% of the total geographic area and about a little bit less than 10% of the population, you're gonna have more than half, for the entire community, more than half of child and elder abuse, preventable injury and death, violent crimes, teenage runaways, diabetes complications, neonatal abstinence syndrome, lead poisoning in children, respiratory disorders of children and adults, premature birth and child psychiatric conditions in, in just the yellow areas. So if there is an organization that's really trying to make a dent in these types of problems um, in a community, now you know you need to be focused on this 5% of the, of the population in, uh, and in this 5% of the geographic area. And just to look at the causes of death, this is Little Rock, Arkansas. In this case, you also have the highest risk places are, are uh, the little yellow squares. But what we found is that if you look at the four types of death, suicide, homicide, accident, and natural causes of death, that the majority of all causes of death occur in the highest risk places, including natural. And the reason for that is the 20-year um, 
loss of life, the early death, you know, 20 years earlier than you're supposed to die in these areas. You have more babies being born prematurely and dying in these areas. So not only are you dealing with the accidents, which is going to be, uh, you know, falls and burns and drowning and suffocation and things like that, but you're also going to have the homicides, which is usually firearm related or, you know, the stabbings and the shootings. The suicide is a little bit more even across the different areas, but you have all of these deaths occurring. And if you look at this on a map like this, here the highest risk places are in blue. Um, this map shows the dots of where all of these different types of deaths occurred. So it's not just child maltreatment that we're seeing in these places. We're seeing um, the problems that we're trying to prevent across a whole spectrum of issues that are related to social determinants of health and, uh, and child maltreatment. And what we're talking about are areas that are this small. So here, the red squares are the squares that are the highest risk places. And I want you to think for a minute about you know, what the people in these environments are really experiencing because they have the majority of the crime, the majority of the poverty, they have their children dying, their elders are dying earlier. That's where the child maltreatment is occurring, it's where the shootings are occurring. So this is in an environment of in immense trauma and stress that a very small proportion of the population is experiencing, and that's why we see them in our healthcare systems with a lot of these problems that are uh, difficult to solve, because we try to solve the problems as if they exist alone, as if the diabetes is just a problem uh, of itself and we just need to treat that diabetes, but we need to also think about the environment that this is coming from. And so this, is, uh, this came from an elder abuse article but it talks about the boundaries of resilience theory because people in this space talk a lot about resilience of people that live in environments like this. But the experiences of vulnerable residents of high crime neighborhoods suggest the existence of a tipping point or a point beyond which an individual's strength and plasticity can no longer withstand the cascading host of external and compounding stressors. So that's what we're, we're really dealing with in these areas. So now that we know where the problem is. We know exactly which houses, which businesses, we know which streets, we have a very clear map of where the problems are. How do we recruit or engage the people that live in the high-risk areas to participate in programs, services, and education? Anyone here that has tried to work in community, uh, in community outreach knows that this is always a problem. So that's the reason that I started looking into this piece, and we figured out a way that you can use market segmentation to do this. So market segmentation is something that we're all familiar with, even if we don't realize we're familiar with it. Um, it's the way in which companies collect data from all of us and then break us into segments of the population. This graph just shows uh, how the population is broken in to, I can't remember how many segments it is now, I think it's about 80 segments based on um, income and preferences by a company called Buxton that we've worked with before. So what this really is, is you have uh, data out there about you that is uh, connected back to the address where you live. So things like what you watch on the news or the magazines that you read, your interests and hobbies, wearables and implantables, anything that has a connection through either your credit card or through some other mechanism back to the address where you live. Um, anything you, you know, your shopping, your mail ordering, your property and utilities, your finances, insurance products, your uh, email, your, the where, where you travel, what you give to charity, your cars, the demographics, you know, what you watch on television, YouTube, social media, location, all of this is collected about all of us all the time. Um, and what they do with it is they create profiles of certain households. And if you're looking at it in a way that is place-based, you could look at a census tract, which is about this big. And you can look at all of the a group of houses together and start to break it down by the zip code plus four into even smaller groupings. And this is how they look at all of our interests and data and determine what about um, us is similar based on where we live. So for example, if you live uh, in the blue dot house here, you're likely to be a 45 to 54 year old college graduate with two children that are 13 and 15. You like to watch Law and Order, you dine out three times a month, you lease your vehicles and you shop at Sam's Club. Now I'm not saying this isn't creepy, um, <laughs> but this is the data that they use to sell us everything that we buy. And there are companies that have this information. And so my thought was, 
if the information like, like this exists to sell us a computer or a new phone or whatever it is that we're interested in, why can't we use the same type of information to sell prevention to people that are living in these high-risk communities? So what we did is we took the addresses from inside the red, the red squares here and fed them through a market segmentation uh, generator with one of these companies. And what we learned, is, it, this was in Little Rock in particular, it's different in every city we've modeled, but um, you learn things about the people. So you learn that they're very low income, that they may be high school graduates, that you have single females, that they rent, they listen to the radio, they are unlikely to have dental insurance, for example. They like to rent videos from convenience stores and they shop at the Dollar General. This is just an example. And so what you can do with that is you can figure out how to partner, partner with dentists to provide discounted dental services, for example. You can promote job training and low-cost financial planning. You can recruit people from the lower risk areas to do that. You can educate uh, at Walmart pharmacy services because that's where people are. Or you can offer promotions to incentivize behaviors, like for example, using red box coupons to get people to come to a particular type of training. So there's ways that you can use the consumer analytics data to actually engage the people um, where they are and doing the things that they're doing, like which, uh, they're on radio and television, in this case in Little Rock, Arkansas, but in other places they're gonna be on YouTube all the time. So it's gonna help you to figure out where to put your marketing. One example of how we use this um, in Oregon was uh, adoption agencies completely changed the way they were marketing to likely parents based on, uh, and foster care agencies, based on how the previous foster families engaged with the media. So there are ways that you can, and they increased the number of families that they recruited by you know, 10% every month um, until they met their goal. So this is a way that you can really improve um, your marketing, depending on what, you're try what message you're trying to get out there. So at this point, what we know, if we're trying to prevent child maltreatment, is we know exactly where we need to be focusing our efforts. We have an idea based on the ranking of the risk features, what we need to be focusing on, and we know who we're trying to reach based on uh, market segmentation. This is really all the information you should need to be able to mount a successful prevention program. At least that's what I thought. So then we got into the align phase of this, the predict, align, prevent. And what we've done in all of these places is we tried to get everybody together to get on the same page towards the same prevention goals using collective impact initiatives, if anyone has ever heard that term. That's the, that's the term that people use. And so the idea was to standardize across all of these different agencies to work in the same direction um, and you know, get everybody together and, and really have a, a collaborative effort where we're using the resources that were already present in the community in the most effective way possible. And I thought what would happen once you got all of these groups of people together, which we did, and explained to them how all of their problems were um, connected by adverse childhood experiences, connected by child maltreatment, and why we needed to be working on these particular things, I thought that we would all kind of naturally, out of this maze of services and problems, form you know, a straight line to prevention, but it failed. It failed over and over again to be able to achieve the kind of large-scale prevention that I was shooting for. We did achieve smaller programs that did uh, amazing things for you know, infant mortality reduction or helping with lead poisoning in children or um, physical abuse reduction, but not the overall decreasing child maltreatment um, at a population scale over a period of you know, two to five years, which is what I was going for. And what I realized was that all of these different organizations that harbor the data that you need to be able to do this type of analysis and work, they don't share data with each other. They don't really work together. They don't really see um, how they connect, even if they do know about ACEs. And the issue is that each one of them has the thing that they're focused on, right? So child uh, and adult protective services, they're mostly focused on the, the treatment of whatever the problem is. So you know, investigating the issue and then providing services for that. And prevention is just this tiny little offshoot that they do. They don't really share data with public health, believe it or not, they really don't. And public health is focused on you know, whatever, whatever their issue is. Let's say it's sexually transmitted infection prevention. They're focused on that and prevention is a tiny little offshoot. 
And so each one of the agencies is like this. And it's not their fault that it's like this because the treatment of whatever the problem is is what they're tasked with doing. And so what, what I really ultimately came to realize in trying to get all of these people to work together is that um, no one is really responsible for prevention. Not really. Not of the adverse childhood experiences as a whole if you look at where it all occurs in space and how it all occurs together. And the types of treatments that we're doing, if you look at adverse childhood experiences, which is at the top of this tree, or if you look at community adverse experiences, which is at the root of this tree, we're trying to treat things once they're already in fruition, once they're already a problem. We're not trying to get to the, to the root cause. And so uh, I almost gave up. I came really close to giving up because how do you overcome an issue like this where the system itself is designed to not be focused on prevention, to not work together? How do you get around that? And then I started thinking about it like this. So we have these high-risk places where all of the data and all of the problems occur. Above that, you have city governments, county governments that have all of the, they're the ones that extract the data and the ones that hold the most, the most granular data, the most important things that we need to be able to figure out where the people need help. That information then goes up to the state agencies that then goes up to the federal government that has all of the money. And the, uh, you know, the foundations, I would say, are in that area as well. So the way I think about this now is that the data really belongs to the city or the county, and it gets smaller as it goes up toward the federal government. But the money, and of course the high-risk places don't have any of the data because no one shares the, the data that's relevant to the community with the community. And the money is all with the federal government and kind of trickles down. And the community also doesn't get any of the money because all of the money goes to these agencies that are in, in the middle. So we've got these high-risk places where the people are actually experiencing all of these terrible problems that don't have any of the money or any of the data. So how do we get the money and the data to the high-risk places? And so what I think that we need to do at this point if we want to prevent child abuse and neglect is to shift the focus of aligning services to a governor's office. Now the reason that I think a governor's office is the, uh, is the place for this is that the governor is the only entity that can actually uh, get the data from all of the different places to be able to do the analysis. And I think that we should do all of the analysis that I showed you guys, the place-based risk modeling um, and prevention strategy there, have outcomes that we're tracking from there, and also centralize all of the funding for prevention programs in that agency so that we can get the data and the money to the community itself. And the types of prevention that we need to be working on are things that will um, address the child risk factors and the perpetrator risk factors and the adverse childhood experiences. So I've come up with a list of 10 programs that I think would do this. Now I want to point out that the focus would be to get these services to all of the people that would be eligible inside the highest risk areas and it would be entirely voluntary. So people would be able to sign up for these things if they wanted to, but it would not be absolutely required, obviously. The first is nurse family partnership. Um, I'm just gonna go through a couple of these, but the, the things that we know nurse family partnership addresses are child abuse and neglect, pediatric chronic illness, emotional and behavioral difficulties, you guys see the list. Um, Cure Violence is a program that treats violence like a communicable disease and seeks to stop the spread of violence from person to person. They've had incredible results in cities like Baltimore in reducing the number of shooting deaths by like 86% in the place where they've focused their, their treatment. This is a way to address um, domestic violence, social isolation if you're reducing the violence in the community, reducing incarceration if you have fewer violent incidents. Um, generation uh, one and two crime prevention through environmental design. This is a program that looks at how you increase risk just based on the way that your environment is designed. So in this case, on the left-hand side, you see a house that's overgrown. So if you have a decreased uh, line of sight or vision to a house, you're gonna have more 
a, a higher likelihood of having a robbery there because people can get away with it. So if you, you know, trim the bushes back, you can reduce the number of crimes occurring in that place just by doing that thing. And you can do this with all types of environments, with convenience stores that are usually attractors for things like aggravated assault, for example. So there are lots of different ways that you can engineer the environment to make it safer. Universal basic income, especially for women with uh, small children that are living in extreme poverty in these high-risk environments, uh, would very likely be helpful. This type of program is being piloted in different places across the country with good success. Free college education for people in high-risk places can help to uh, decrease single parenthood because people are more likely to get married and stay married if they had to have an education. Uh, girls are less likely to have children at a young age if they have a higher education. Uh, of course, this is going to reduce poverty, um, and it also reduces things like unemployment. Free child care would be one way to prevent child abuse and neglect if the mo mom isn't leaving the baby with a boyfriend, for example, if they have a place to take the child. And of course, Early Head Start is one of the, the best type of uh, child care programs that's out there. Pregnancy prevention, obviously, if you don't have un unwanted children, um, and also very young mothers, your risk factors for child maltreatment will be reduced. Mobile medical clinics, taking mental health care and prenatal care, infant care, child care to the community to make it very convenient, especially in places where uh, transportation is not reliable, has been effective. And doing things like crisis intervention teams with the police so that you have someone showing up and recommending services, uh, psychiatric care, drug treatment care instead of incarceration is something that would be helpful. And then, if all of these things are being implemented in these very small areas, we should see a reduction in these types of things over time. So of course what we're looking for is a decrease in substantiated child maltreatment, but we also want to see a you know, decrease in removals from the home for children, a decrease in preventable deaths for adult and children, traumatic deaths included, and also all of these other things. Now, these types of um, issues can be measured. You can measure you know, how many gunshot wounds did a hospital see in a 12-month in a period. That's something that you can look at. And you can also measure the cost of that. So the $547 billion cost that we talked about before, often people will look at things like you know, lifelong productivity and the loss of productivity as part of that number. But you could also look at very direct costs to a community like this to see how, are the interventions that are being um, offered to this community actually reducing things that the community itself is paying for. And so over time, uh, I think that all of these things would be reduced. Uh, this very new idea, I was very grateful again to Laura for letting me talk with you guys about this, and I look forward to hearing some comments and, and questions. But uh, at this point, we're looking for a volunteer city, a governor, and funding. So very early in the process. And this is all of my uh, contact information. I didn't bring any cards with me. So um, if anybody wants to talk with me, this is how uh, to get in contact. So I want to hear, first of all, what, what you guys think about the, the, the process, the idea, and if you have any suggestions. Yes, sir. If we were ever, we, I've, we haven't modeled a, a military base. I don't know if we would even be able to do that, but the, um, the domestic violence and so, the suicide attempts, things like that would be captured in the modeling, but I agree with you, yes, that, that would be, uh, you probably in an area where you are, you have a lot of veterans, you probably would have increased risk, as you can see in increased rates of child abuse in some of those areas too. Okay. Quite 
So I'll give you some examples. In Fort Worth, Texas, we were able to use that information to uh, address one, another major problem that they had that spans um, infant, mor infant mortality, which spans both maternal morbidity, uh, you know, just infant wellness and child maltreatment because the most common cause of death in infants is suffocation in an unsafe sleeping environment. So we were able to use that information to focus attention on particular churches and um, community centers that were in the highest risk areas to provide things like education and you know pack and plays and we went and changed all the policies in the hospitals so that the nurses were modeling safe sleep behaviors, that sort of thing. And we did see a reduction in infant in suffocation related infant mortality in the city over a couple of years. In New Hampshire, we found in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, we found that 98% of the child lead poisoning was occurring in like two apartment complexes. And the lead abatement people in the in the state had no idea. Because I know that this seems, when you look at this, you're like, well, doesn't everybody already do this? Like, don't we already know on maps where all this stuff, no, we really don't. And so they started um, you know, letting people know, hey, you're at risk for lead poisoning here and giving out water, things like that. Um, and we've done, you know, like we, I was talking about the uh, recruitment of foster families in Oregon, we worked on that. And there have been other, other smaller projects, but I could never get everyone to coalesce around um, violence prevention, which I think is probably the most important aspect that comes up in the predictive modeling with violence and domestic violence being one of the main contributors. There needs to be a big population-based focus on violence prevention that changes social norms around violence, uh, uh, around, um, you know, in parenting, but also in other types of relationships and just society's acceptance of violence as, uh, as normal to begin to reduce violence. And that, but, but talking a group of people that are working on vastly different things into focusing their money and their efforts on that is very difficult because if, let's say you're talking about a nonprofit that's focused on poverty prevention. Their grant funding or their, the money that they're getting is tied to that particular outcome. So you, they can't really be flexible with what the data says to be able to shift over toward, toward that thing which is why I think that prevention needs to be something that is centralized and accountable. Someone, some agency or group needs to be responsible for prevention because if there isn't something like that, there is no one that's responsible for prevention. So we've done some amazing work that has helped a lot of kids, but we have not achieved the um, moving the needle on reducing child maltreatment rates in a population the way that I want to. Yes, ma'am. So the agencies are usually part of the analysis process because they have to provide the data. So every, and every agency has a different set of data. So juvenile justice has some of it and education has some of it and healthcare has some of it, health and human services. So depending on where you are, like in New Hampshire, all of that is under one, one umbrella. And so when you release the, the analysis to them and explain it to them, they're all at the table and then can start making plans based on what the data shows. When it comes to the communities themselves, what I've done before is literally just go to the community and be like, look at this. And it's been very interesting with uh, churches, for example, in Little Rock, I remember one experience I had where I, I called a church and I said, you guys are smack dab in the middle of a, of a high risk area for child maltreatment. And they said to me, no, 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 we don't have that problem here. That problem is on the other side of the freeway. And that's something that has been true in every city that we've modeled is that you have the high risk place that everyone thinks is the only place where there's problems in the entire city. But what our modeling always shows is that there's, there are problems there, but the same problems exist all across the city in smaller areas. And so uh, engaging people and getting them to even recognize that there's a problem is one thing. Um, the next thing that I will mention is, I said at some point that the communities themselves have no data. The way that I know that is that people will say, well, you have to go to the community and get them to tell you what they need. But I went to the community and I asked them, in so many words, what is killing your children? 
And the way that I ask that is, how do you prevent the deaths of children in your area? And no one, not the community themselves, not the people that, the, the service workers that worked in those communities, they had no idea that suffocation was the leading cause of infant death in those areas. And if you don't know what is killing your children or how to prevent it, then you're not gonna be able to come up with a plan to actually prevent that thing. And so one of the most important um, aspects is taking the data back to the community itself, and not just the people that work in the community, but to the people that live in the community let them know what's happening so that they can formulate plans for prevention amongst themselves. So it's a lot of communication. Yes, sir. So I have talked about this all over the world um, for the last 10 years in front of you know, giant tech crowds of 10,000 people or very small community meetings. I mean, I've talked with a lot of different people, including um, in, you know, people from the government. And the CDC does have a, a project working on social determinants of health, um, but even, even an agency like the CDC doesn't have all of the different data points. And so one thing that's unique about what we have done here is everything, everything that we work with when it comes to the analysis is at a point level. So we're looking at address level data to look at the associations between all of these different factors and child maltreatment in particular. And that level of data is something that's very hard to obtain. Um, and like in some places, you'll call up the police department and say, hey, I need you to send me the addresses of all of the um, domestic violence arrests that you had in the last year. And some people, I mean, obviously you're, you have an agreement in place and data security and all of that is already in place. And some people will just be like, oh sure, and they'll send you an email five minutes later. And another group will start out with, that's unconstitutional, we can't do that. And so you really have a very, a, a, a lot of different ideas on what data can be accessed and how it can be used. And I think that the discussion around that, especially if you include the potential for bias in a lot of this data, because it does include some crime data, juvenile justice data, people will get kind of um, edgy with that. And so they, they don't want to get the address level data. That's something I've been working on the, with the ACLU. Yes, ma'am. So I spoke with, uh, a, a, I don't know, about a year ago, two years ago, with uh, some people from the governor's office. But at that time, I had the uh, up to the analysis, up to the align part, but I wasn't recommending programs yet. So the thing that's different in this new iteration that I'm here talking about today is that I think that the next time I go into a community with this work, I wanna go in with the funding for the, for the programs already intact so that it's not something that you're expecting the, the service sector really to come up with, which is I think gonna be a different a different proposal to a government, to a governor's office, than going in with just the analysis phase would be. That's my hope. Thank you so much for listening to this. I know it's very different. I appreciate your time today. Thank you. Thank you.